So this one is about EarthScope. So EarthScope is a, a big project in the, the United States and a little bit in Canada and Mexico. But it's uh, oriented towards exploring the structure and evolution of the North American continent. And it's an idea of a way to talk about it. It's the Earth science version of the Hubble Space Telescope. So instead of looking into space, we're looking at the Earth. And so in that sense, it enables the survey mode of the continent that cannot be achieved with individual science-driven efforts alone. And then it was named the number one epic project by Popular Science, which is a magazine in the U.S., because it was so useful, it was uh, a lot of uh, bang for the buck. In other words, there was a lot that was coming from the investment. Um, and it was also both practical and allowed for exploration. And so this map shows the distribution of the stations, and I'll talk about each part in order. So the, the, there's three main observatories for a scope. So our scope's like the big umbrella. And the first observatory is called the Plate Boundary Observatory, and that's uh, continuous GPS receivers and borehole strain meters in Western North America mostly. The second observatory is called the U.S. Array, so that's a seismometer array that moves across the country. So the, the U.S. Array is the triangles on this map, and the Plate Boundary Observatory would be the circles. And then the third main observatory is the San Andreas Fault Observatory at depth, which is this star, so it was drilled into the San Andreas Fault. So just to show, and the science plan for EarthScope is, uh, has this kind of broad perspective, so synoptic means kind of looking from overall. It has community data and facilities, so all the data is free and open. Everybody gets it as soon as it's generated. No one owns any data. Um, there's this hierarchical nesting of the focus projects within the broad coverage. So we can do little studies, but we always have this surrounding uh, information. And it's very integrative and multidisciplinary. So it's not just geophysics, it's also geology. And so the science targets that are, are studied are imaging the crust and lithosphere, active deformation, continental evolution over geologic time, deeper structure and dynamics, earthquakes, faults, and rheology, magmas and volatiles, topography and tectonics, earth scope in the hydrosphere, cryosphere and atmosphere, and then understanding hazards. And so here's the plate boundary observatory. And so you can see these all these red are velocities from continuous GPS receivers. So there's 1,100 of them plus these 7,575 borehole strain meters and seismometers. And so you can see the plate boundary is shearing, and then there's strain accumulation on the subduction zone. And unfortunately, there's not PBO in Canada, because it's just Canada, the United States. But Canada has uh, some regional networks as well. So it's possible to look at the whole plate boundary. And here's, here's Alaska. So you can see some stations are moving a lot. And some of these are because they're on volcanoes, like this one. This one, I don't know what's happening. But overall, you can see the strain accumulation, so there's pretty good locking of this part of the subduction zone because we see that these stations are moving to the north. Uh, and then here you see this turn as it gets next to the Denali Fault. So remember, there's the ice shows from the Denali earthquake that strikes the fault there behind the arc. And here's the sort of main North American plate boundary situation where we have the shearing across the San Andreas Fault System, and then we go to this triple junction here, so there's a transform to subduction zone, and so this is Cascadia, and so here you can see some interesting motions. There's some coupling here of, ca of basically plate or uh, trench normal, but a lot of southern Cascadia still shows margin parallel shearing. So it's kind of a complex pattern of deformation in in this region. So there's a picture of a continuous GPS receiver in Alaska. So here's the plate boundary observatory now. I mean, this is, sorry, this is U.S. Array now, today. And so there's these four parts of U.S. Array. There's the transportable array, which are these circles. 
And so these are broadband seismometers that are moving across North America. So they are de they're installed at some point, and it stays in one place for 18 months. And then once its time is up, it moves to the front. So these guys are just about to be removed, and they'll go to the front. So it's like rolling along. And so it started in, in western U.S., and it's moved all the way across. And so... <clears throat> Uh, so we've already imaged, we've already been in Western North America and now in Central North America. The reference network is a blue, so that's always there. And so that gives us some general constraints on reference what's happening. The, the purple are legacy stations. So like here in Arizona, where, where I, we live, we had a grant to buy these stations so we could leave them there. And so that was good because once you install a seismic station site, if you could leave it and, and continue to have a long record. Then the flexible array are experiments. So people propose they want to do a detailed study somewhere, and so they can do profiles. So these are across an old rift in the middle of a continent. This is a deep study uh, here of, of magnetism and uh, the deep part of the subduction zone and so on. So these stations will get to, they'll be, the end of installation will be in September this year. So they'll, this will be full by September. And then they'll leave, they'll be completely gone 18 months later, and they're going to Alaska. And so 400 now in North America, this part of North America, they'll go to, there'll be 280 that go to Alaska. We couldn't take all 400. And then the final part of the U.S array is magnetotellurics, and so there are magnetotelluric base stations, and then there's a campaign of measuring MT uh, across the northern part of this region that gives uh, really good constraints on the structure of the lithosphere also. So here's a, a guy in, installing one of the seismometers for U.S. array, so there are broadband seismometers going in these uh, vaults. And so they're very high quality records. And here's an example of some of the structural information that comes from the US array. So this left would be just this, the seismic wave speed at 90 kilometers, so the base of the lithosphere. And D4 Earth scope, it looked like this. So all we knew it was kind of fast to slow. But now we see so much more structure. And we can see things like this blue at 90, that's the, the slab. So this is the subducting slab. We're seeing the cold uh, subduction zone. Then we see this hot, basically, w Western North America. Then this is Yellowstone, so big uh, volcanic system in the middle of the continent. And then as we head to the east, we're, co we're generally colder as we get to the craton, to the old the part of the lithosphere. But there's continuing to be interesting features out here that we'll see and continue to get new results on. So one of the things that U.S. Array has done is given us really good records of earthquakes in both far and near. So maybe you heard about this earthquake in 2011. It was in Virginia. It was a 5.8. So it's western north, or eastern U.S. near the capital. So this, you know, the government was shaken. Like this is called the National Cathedral, and it was damaged in this earthquake. And it's not usual to have this size of earthquake in eastern U.S., but it gets attention to the government, which may be helpful. And so here's a, the U.S. array recording a nearby earthquake. So at that time, you see where the U.S. array was. And so let's see if we can watch it. So remember, this is at the yellow point. So here comes the earthquake wave. So it's pretty fast. And you see this interesting reverberation in the south. It's kind of noisy for a long time after the earthquake there. Maybe some of that noise is not actually the earthquake itself. But let's watch. Um, so this seismogram is from this place. So the earthquake occurred at time zero. So these waves are heading out. There, there's the uh, first wave hitting. There's a P wave coming in. 
nice radio. Now we'll see this pretty noisy uh, wave train coming through surface waves and reflected so on. So that's a closed earthquake. So it has especially that really radial appearance or, you know, just the ripples going out. So then this is uh, from this Sumatra earthquake from last year that was in the oceanic plate, these big earthquakes. And one of the things that part of our work in Earthscope is education. And so Iris guys made this nice little movie about the, the earthquake. Why did it happen? Why did these big earthquakes happen? So basically there's a plate boundary there off of uh, northern Sumatra between India and Australia. The India Australia boundary is kind of diffuse, not so sharp, but it's in that zone that maybe these earthquakes occurred. We have the subduction. We know about this. We know about this uh, process. So those earthquakes were not on the subduction interface. They were outside in the Indian plate, in that oceanic plate, and they showed this kind of sinistral motion. And because they were sinistral, uh, and this shows earthquakes at that time, these are the aftershocks, they are probably strikes flip. They weren't uh, dip flips, so there was not much of a tsunami generated by these earthquakes. And so, the, basically, there's this zone of, of kind of fractured oceanic crust that is in this region, and these really big earthquakes occurred there. So that's the like educational movie associated with that uh, earthquake. And so then, here would be the the U.S. array ground motion visualization. So. Now it's coming from very far away, so you can kind of contrast what uh, the Virginia earthquake looked like. So we have all these body waves coming, but from very deep, it's 140 degrees away. So there's the first, um, those are S waves, so still body waves coming. And then R1 will be the main surface wave train coming. So it takes like more than an hour to get there. So here they are. It's not so coherent, but it's not too bad. And because it's 140, the other side is 220, so it's not so long till we get the other direction of waves coming, R2. And so this shows the rich behavior of the seismic wave field that if you have an array, you can see. So any comments or questions? The first ones came from, um, I think, from the west. Yeah, from kind of the north. So the great circle from Sumatra to North America is kind of pretty northerly, northwest. And it's 140 degrees. Yes. So the next part of Earth scope was the San Andreas Fault Observatory at depth. So they drilled a well into the, well, basically down. So this is a view from underground. So they drilled straight down about two and a half kilometers, and then they turned the well, and they went across, they punched across the fault at about 3.5 kilometers depth. And this is near Parkfield. Remember, I showed Parkfield area. So there's some earthquakes at this level. And so we think the fault zone is pretty complex with many surfaces, but on these various surfaces are earthquakes. And what they did was to, the idea was to observe uh, earthquakes in the near field with se borehole seismometers, but also to take cores out, and to pull the cores from the, the fault, fault zone. And so this just shows, this is a map, 200 meters by 200 meters, and so this shows the borehole coming down and across the fault zone, and then they they 
went out here in these shows where they pulled the cores. So they went across these faults. And then here's a cross section. So this is depth versus distance. So they come down and they pulled these cores from these fault zones. And then here's a, one of the cores. So you see the fault zone is very gouged, rocks, some serpentine. But one of the important things is they found talc and serpentinite, especially on some of these fault surfaces. And so this may explain why fault is weak and why the earthquakes are localized there. So it's an important study of, of the exact rocks that are in the fault now that are slipping. Instead of having to wait, you know, three million years till erosion brings the surface to them. So Seifat's the third part of Earth's main Earth scope. So here's the guys pulling the cores out. So one other thing that was done in Earth scope was there was some additional investments, like some LIDAR coverage for Western North America on active faults. So I showed this one from Denali. This is a Earth scope data set. So remember, you can see this right lateral offset here from the Denali rupture. And so we have these data in open topography. So some of them are Earth scope related. So Earth scope, we, so I, my, one of my other jobs when I'm not lecturing with to you guys is I am the director of the Earth scope national office. So at ASU, we have an office that helps coordinate everything. So we don't do the network. But because that's done by other groups, but we kind of do education and outreach associated with EarthScope, and so we run the website. Uh, and um, so one of my students, her job is to run the Facebook for EarthScope, and the idea is to use social media for science education and outreach. So, you know, for different groups, especially younger uh, people, students, they really into social media, right? And so it en enters their lives all the time. And so we want to, to try to reach them. And so it's kind of an experiment, right? Because around the world, we're trying to decide, everyone's trying to decide, well, how much is my personal life connected with my professional life? And uh, the Facebook is one of those places where that meets. And so on one hand, you could say, well, I don't, I'm not, I'm just doing my own thing, you know, but other people are doing everything in social media, which means professional and personal. And so we wanted to make this available as a way to build a community. So it's kind of been an experiment, and it's been fairly successful. And so we also have Twitter Twitter feed, and we tried LinkedIn, Google+, Pinterest. And so, and also you see uh, we have a picture of these memory sticks we're using here. So, uh, so anyway, this is something. If you guys want to, you can join, join us, link to us. So, just as some other references, just so you guys know. So, we EarthScope is one uh, umbrella, but then Iris and UNAVCO are two big group, big facilities that run. So, Iris, these guys run the US Ray, so they're part of EarthScope but they also have big education outreach activities. And so you can go to this place and there's tons of information about recent earthquakes. Like, so the ground motion visualizations I showed and that movie about the Sumatra earthquake was from here. And then here's the UNAVCO. So these are the PBO facility managers and they have many short courses and uh, educational resources about especially GPS and geodesy here. And this is more seismology. So that's, I could talk for many days about Earthscope, but uh, I just wanted to give a little taste. So any questions?